Ready to start? Yeah, we are. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dev Nation Day Modern App Dev, December 12th. Uh, greetings, developers, and welcome to a day dedicated to accelerating your business transformation and unlocking the power of cloud native technologies with your unique enterprise applications. Today, you'll have the opportunity to learn from Red Hat experts and practitioners and gain valuable insights into best practices in application development for the hybrid cloud using Red Hat OpenShift in Kubernetes. This event promises to be packed with information you can readily apply to your own projects, dive deep into a variety of learning tracks, each led by industry experts covering a vast landscape of topics such as AI, ML, app modernization, integration, serverless computing, security, event-driven architecture, internal development platforms, containers, application architecture, and much, much more. I'm not sure how much more we could pack into a day. In, uh, in addition to the learning tracks, you'll have the ability to take advantage of some interactive virtual labs where you can gain hands-on experience with Red Hat's technologies. And also be sure to check out our keynote today from Red Hat and Intel, and then hear the hear about the winner of the the recent uh, hackathon event. Um, just a couple of logistics for today. Uh, there are three sessions going on in parallel, so feel free to join whichever track that interests you, and you're welcome to hop between tracks uh, as you go. Um, be sure to join our keynote. As I mentioned, that will be held over on the main stage. So you'll need to pop over to the main stage at 10 a.m. Eastern for the keynote and then rejoin the tracks afterwards from that point. Um, for any questions you may have at this point, uh, just drop them into the into the comments section. And, and if we have time or as we have time, we'll, we'll try to field those at the end of these sessions. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Jeremy Davis, who will be presenting today on Avoiding Microservices Madness with uh, Majestic Monoliths. And Jeremy, it looks like we need you to share your slides real quick here as well as we get, get the uh, coffee going this morning. I'm going to share my entire screen here. Perfect. Perfect. And I'll just bounce over to my slides. So we'll get the little uh, super haul there. All right, so here's my slide. So um, thanks for joining this morning or afternoon, depending upon where you are. Um, if it's kind of early, hopefully you grab a cup of coffee and sit back for this uh, this session on avoiding microservices madness with majestic monoliths. My name is Jeremy Davis. You can find me uh, here on my slide, uh, jeremy.davis at redhat.com. You can find me on the various socials over there. Um, I go by the uh, tag arrogant programmer. Um, so you can find me on Twitter, uh, threads, and, uh, and Mastodon. Uh, Mastodon at techhub.social. Feel free. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, uh, please reach out to me and let me know. Um, hopefully, you'll find this um, this content interesting. Uh, so uh, I've been my, my quick background. I've been at Red Hat for 13 years, um, working mostly with application development technologies uh, the past few years, really heavily with cloud related things. Um, and microservices popped up about seven years ago. I became very enamored of the notion of microservices, as I think most of the dev world did at the time. Um, the guys that coined the phrase, Martin Fowler, who, who coined the phrase microservices, uh, caution people not to start projects with microservices. Of course, I did that just that. I think a lot of other people did as well and found themselves in some painful situations. And then a couple of years, and so you, a situation like this, right? So you end up with the microservices death star, right? With like services uh, that explode everywhere and it becomes very uh, difficult um, to version across these, uh, often they become coupled together. So you end up with like some of these, but end up being distributed monoliths. But there were a lot of problems in building microservices in it. And, and having done a couple of projects uh, with this architecture, I was reminded of uh, Fowler's caution not to begin um, with microservices. And then I read this blog post um, or a couple of blog posts by David Hannemeyer Hansen. If you remember him, uh, or if you're not aware of him, he's the guy that created Ruby on Rails. Um, he recently, he's created his own alternative to Kubernetes. So he's always an interesting guy to follow. Uh, it's interesting to follow his blog to get his take on things. But early on in the microservices days, he talked about what he called the majestic monolith. And he's with a company called 37 Signals. They're a SaaS software company. And he taught, he, in, in his blog post here, The Majestic Monolith, he talked about how people were asking him, when are you going to refactor to microservices? And his answer was never. And the reason he wasn't going to do that was that they went to production every Friday. And typically speaking, the reason you want to move to microservices or, or a microservices architecture is so that you can get features 
in, in front of your customers uh, quicker than you do at present. And he said for his company, going to production every Friday was fine. So a one, one week cycle of, you know, accepting a story to putting it into production was okay. He didn't need to go faster than that. And so he wasn't going to take on the added headache or the added overhead of distributed computing, um, which if you've built microservices, you know that there is significant added overhead and added headache. He followed that up a bit later with this uh, second blog post called The Majestic Monolith Becoming a Citadel. And the notion behind this is you can extract a microservice. When we talk about taking legacy code, we often talk about a strangler pattern, right? We sort of, you know, strangle the existing monolith and pull out uh, pull out microservices one at a time. Well, this is a little bit of a different approach. And this approach is leave most of the application as a monolith and then pull out the pieces um, that you do need to scale. And this resonated with me because one of the customers, in fact, one of the first customers I worked with in refactoring an application to a microservices architecture, the reason that we did that was because of a particular part of the application had a hard time scaling, right? Um, one of the things about monoliths is you have to scale the entire monolith. And this customer, there was a a, a section of the application that did some really hardcore processing and they were having to scale up lots and lots of application servers um, to to be able to to meet that processing needs and we thought you know what what if we just pull that out into a microservices architecture we can kind of leave the rest or, or split it into maybe just one or two services and then we can scale those services individually right so we were able to scale up this one particular service that needed a lot of power whereas the rest kind of just coasted along so I thought this was a really good idea. And having built a couple of microservices applications, um, I decided that I would try uh, Martin Fowler's approach of start with a monolith, and then if we need to, um, extract some of the, the uh, code into a, uh, into a microservice. And so here's seven things that I, that I think can help you do that, or that really can help you do that. Um, and the seven things really quickly, embrace code quality, commit to continuous, at least continuous-ish delivery, um, domain-driven design and bounded context, which has nothing particularly to do with microservices, but picked up a lot of speed once microservices um, you know, popped up because a microservice and a domain or a microservice and a, it matches a bounded context. And so people began looking at that again. It's still a great practice, great, great way to build your applications. Also putting APIs first, and I don't just mean REST APIs or GraphQL APIs um, or, or like Kafka and Avro. There's different ways you can look at APIs. Um, another thing is making data autonomous, if you can, from the very start. One of the um, bottlenecks traditionally for microservices architectures, especially if you're moving legacy code to microservices, is that uh, your you know, data ties you together. Um, applications have single data sources. If you can avoid that when you start, um, you can uh, you gain a lot of flexibility. And then eventually, citadels and outposts, uh, implementing the citadels and outposts pattern. So you can pull out some functionality and turn that into an outpost from your microservice. All right, so first things first, code quality. Um, there's a lot of different type things you can use for code quality, and um, I'm a fan of sticking some of these things inside of your, your Maven POM file when you build it. So let's jump over here. I mentioned I'm going to do a lot of jumping around. So um, let's see. Can you guys see that okay? I guess I can't really hear anybody. Let me um, pop this. Uh, I'll make this a little bit bigger, font a little bit bigger. Let's go to 24, see if that helps a bit. Is that better? Yeah, maybe it'll be a little bit bigger than that. 24. Where are we? Where? All right, maybe. Ah. All right, let's say Quarkus create app. And I'm going to use Quarkus for this. Um, there's not really any specific, there's one little bit of specific Quarkusness, um, but uh, only one create app. Auto, arrogant, programmer, colon. And we're going to use um, the domain uh, since it's winter. I thought it'd be fun to have a hot chocolate pop-up truck, right? So we'll have a hot chocolate pop-up truck. Um, and I think this uh, pop-up truck's a good argument for monoliths because, you know, pop-up truck doesn't need a uh, full microservices architecture. You know, we can probably just get by on a um, monolith and we'll say extensions equals what do we use we use hibernate rm panache we'll use jdbc postgres for our database 
and we'll use rest easy reactive Jackson. So we get Quarkus to create the app. I've got the Quarkus CLI installed. Okay, there's my application. Let's go. Let's see the hot chocolate pop up. Oops, do I already have one? Do I already have one running? I do already have one running. All right, so this is a really basic application here. It comes with some tests. So Quarkus Apps, you guys can see this, um, comes with some code already written and some tests, right? So we've got some tests. What I'm going to do for test quality is I'm going to add to my POM file here. And I like doing this. Anybody else like doing this? I like demarcating my tests. So I'm just going to say testing. And now I'm gonna I'm gonna I am gonna cheat here. I'm gonna copy and paste this. Over here. So what I'm adding in is a Quarkus build of Jacoco, and Jacoco is gonna give us code coverage. So when we run this, let's go ahead and just run this application here in the terminal. We'll say Maven clean test. And what we're going to notice here in our, we're going to run our test. Our test should all pass. Let's hope they all pass. And there's a brand new generated application. Okay. Inside of our target file folder here, we have a Jacoco report. Can you guys see this? Jacoco report. And we've got an index file. Let's open this. We'll say, Open in a browser. Use Chrome here. Ah, here we go. So this is our tests, right? And this has got my package with tests. Um, and it even goes in and shows us, if you haven't seen this before, um, Jacoco goes in and shows us every method that was covered. If I add another method, let's just go add another method with this greeting resource here. Let's just add a post really quickly. And we'll say uh, add post. Um, we'll say, yeah, produce a text plain, public string, hello. It's a post method, so we'll take a string name, and then we'll say, hello. Plus name, plus. And then if we run our tests again, right, this time I'm going to get some red, right? So I'm not going to cover this. All right, there's our test running, all our stuff spinning up. So when we come here now, we've got some red, right? So I'm not covering all my tests. I think this is really nice and useful. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. One of them, I had a tab of that open. So arc unit is, a, is another really interesting one that I like doing. This your architects can um, can come in and define notes. So if we look, so I thought I had this thing uh, popped up already. Um, with our documentation on this. Um, so in this case, you can have these uh, architecture unit, where's the GitHub? Their GitHub site. This allows you to do all kinds of um, ah, examples. Here we go. So the examples are really great, and they they can you can really tie into all kinds of stuff um, that that you want to have, right? So let's just look at like no. Ah. Test. We'll look at the test here. Coding rules test, right? So you can say like no generic exceptions, right? No Java util logging, right? So you can, if you don't want your teams using logging, you can have a rule and you can break builds based on this. Um, so certain things I think you can break builds with. Other things I think it's just kind of nice to have. Um, so like this is really nice if you want to build this up for, for your teams. Um, it's, it's really good to make sure you don't get some, nothing sneaks its way into your code. This stuff, I, you know, I don't think that everything has to have coverage. I mean, this should have coverage, right? But getters and setters don't necessarily need coverage. So I wouldn't break a build on something like this. But on like an architecture unit thing, maybe you would want to break a build. Like if you really want to make sure people aren't using certain classes. Anyway, the, the idea is include this stuff, make it part of your build file, right? So second is continuous-ish delivery. Um, now, uh, I don't know how many people here go to production all the time. Um, I started off talking about David Hanemeyer Hansen and 37 Signals, and they go to production on Fridays. 
Um, I have some friends who've worked at startups that go to production multiple times a day. I think that's really awesome. Uh, but I don't think most of the enterprise does that. I think most of the enterprise has kind of a process to go to production. So I think what's really key is to be able to deploy at any time, meaning have pipelines built. You can have your pipelines built um, on uh, Tekton. This is running on OpenShift here. We can do Tekton. You can do them on GitHub builds. You can put a GitHub build YAML file, right? So all you have to do for a GitHub build here um, is we can come over here, create a, uh, what do we, a new folder, directory dot GitHub slash workflows. And then we can just have a file like build dot YAML. And I've got to build YAML here. I'm going to cheat again. I can't really live code a whole bunch of YAML stuff. So then we have a build with a YAML. When we check this in, uh, GitHub, we can create a create a directory and it'll kick off that build. Actually, let's do that right now. I'll say uh, LS, we're uh, git in it, in it. Add. hide this get commit am gh repo create public um source oh we create we need the name of the repo what are we going to call this call this uh chocolate pop-up and public source and push all right so that pushed to github and we should have a build started so let's uh github jeremy davis um repositories hot chocolate pop-up and let's see our actions running we do so our build is running right so we've got a build running already um it's going to run those tests which actually are we're, we're not going to be covered that well but it's going to run those tests it's going to create our, our application right so just the, the thing is make sure you've got some kind of pipeline in place so it's, it's that easy to just get started doing pipelines make sure you have that stuff in place all right so number three domain driven design um, domain driven design is an old idea i liked it a lot i remember reading about it way long ago maybe 13 or 14 years ago i think when the book came out uh, it gained a lot of traction again when microservices popped up and domain driven design is about how to handle complex business logic um, but there's also ideas inside of DDD that made it marry very well to microservices architectures. And so it sort of has had a resurgence over the past few years. Now, um, the first thing to know about domain-driven design, if you haven't used it before, is um, domains um, are parts of your application, right? So if we're thinking about a hot uh, a pop-up truck, right, we've got a window, right? Because you go up to the window to make your orders and you go up to the window to get your, uh, to get your orders. Um, you've got a barista who's making drinks. You've got some credit card validation, right? Because you got to swipe your credit card, tap your credit card. Um, and then, you know, maybe you have to do some social media or some other things like that, right? And in a microservices architecture, you would typically have a microservices microservice that would deal with each one of these particular areas. Now, in a monolithic application, we're not going to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it, whoops, about our package design. So let's look over at our application here and let's uh, go into presentation mode. Let's go into our presentation mode. And come over here. All right. So We'll get rid of all this extra stuff here that was generated for us. Delete that stuff. Yeah, delete those things. Oops. Delete that stuff. So delete those things. Now, new pack package. So let's create a new package and we'll have a, uh, what are we, uh, hot chocolate pop up right um now we go back to those domains right and we're going to make each one of these a package so we'll have a package for um we'll call it truck window right because windows a little can be a little problematic um inside a java space right you get all these things that used to have windows so we have a truck window um we'll have another package we will have um our barista right so barista um we'll have another package we had credit card credit cards, or we could say payments, whatever we want to call it. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then what else do we have? Like social media, right? 
We won't build out all this stuff. Um, but the idea here is that we're going to keep stuff separate here. And inside of domain-driven design, this also means um, if we do want to pull these out into a microservices, so let's say we want to eventually pull our barista out, barista is already encapsulated inside of its own thing. So uh, it'll make it easier to separate that out. Now, um, bounded contexts. So yeah, we have baristas, we have our counter, we have we don't have a kitchen here, but um, we've got these various different pieces. So I also want to talk about APIs and APIs first. Um, we'll get back to domain driven design in just a second too. So. Uh, I attended a talk many, many years ago um, that was delivered by one of my, uh, uh, somebody else in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta, Georgia at the Atlanta Java Users Group on um, user experience. And one of the things that the presenter, a guy, Burke Huffnagel, he's one of the leaders of AJUG, and he presented at Java One that year, uh, the same presentation. And he asked about user experience, and he was talking to a bunch of Java developers, right? So he said, how many of you guys make front-end code? Like, you know, there's a couple of people. And then he asked who made back-end code, and it was everybody. Right. And so he then asked, well, who uh, how many of you make code that is consumed by other people? Right. So do you think about your user experience for other developers? And it made me think uh, really changed the way that I wrote code a lot. And so um, we talked about some of these kind of best practices here. But one of the things that I um, took away from that and really like to do is to have an API package for each of these. And when we um, communicate through these very or the various parts of the app of our monolith here, our various parts of our application. Whoops. Where is my uh, my window? Oh, we're in presentation mode, aren't we? There we go. All right. So when we come here, we'll have uh, an API, right? So for our barista, we'll have a, an API. I'll we'll say barista. API and make an interface for that, right? And we can have, for instance, um, make you know, beverage, right? And maybe we'll have, uh, you know, we'll call it a, a ticket, right? At the moment, we won't have, we don't have, a, we don't have a domain model yet. Um, we'll call it a ticket. So we'll have a make beverage and we'll say like, you know, ticket. So we'll have these methods. And then when the rest of the application talks to the barista, we'll use this API. And we'll come back to doing that. So when we go back to that, first we'll go back to domain-driven design again. And some of the domain-driven design constructs that you'll run into, aggregates, value objects, services, and repositories. Um, so if we look at what these mean, um, so one, our packet structure does match our bounded con constructs. Um, so let's talk about some of these other objects that we have here. How am I doing on time? We're doing all right on time. So um, what I want to do, let's let's start off with our window, right? So we need a way to get into this thing. And it's fun. Let's, let's get this application running. So one sort of um, construction, we'll say we'll have an infra structure package and a domain package. So in our infrastructure package, let's get something going on here. Let's get a uh, truck window resource. And for this, we're going to say path. And we're going to, let's say, consumes media type. Oh, come on, application JSON, autograph, there we go. And produces JSON, and let's have a post public, um, we will say, return uh, ticket, um, place order. I'm gonna say a place order command. And this is going to be a domain-driven design construct, right? So um, we're going to use, these are go, both going to be value objects, which will be Im, uh, immutable objects. We're not going to persist these things. Let's get a logger in here so we can log things. Say logger. Debug. There we go. Received order for place order command. 
we don't have a placeholder command yet. So let's create our placeholder command object. Um, now, one of the things we would want to do, we'll create a record for this. I mentioned they're immutable objects. Java records marry really, really nicely with this. And typically, we would put this in our domain package, right? This is part of our domain. Put that in our domain, add that. And our record for placeholder command, we need what? We need a string name, and we probably need a beverage, right? Beverage, beverage. Now we don't need a quantity. And we could have like a total, probably like a double, you know, total, right? So we can, uh, so we can get paid for this. Um, let's create our beverage here. We'll create an enum called beverage. Put that in our domain as well. And let's see what's hot chocolate. So let's have like hot chocolate. Let's have like peppermint, hot chocolate, salted caramel, hot chocolate. Yeah. So. Hey, Jeremy, let me interrupt you real quick. Yeah. Uh, I've got some comments coming from the audience. Sure. It looks like the screen that you're sharing right now. You're showing uh, your your slide slide deck and not the, the IDE. Ah, uh-oh. All right. Let's come out of All right, how about now? Can you guys see uh, my... Yeah. Yep, now we see the ID. Ah, so presentation mode is not working. All right, sorry. Thank you for mentioning that. Sorry about that. I will very quickly go back over what we've got uh, going on here. So um, this is a resource. So I've got an endpoint called window. It's our truck window resource. And did you guys see the other stuff I did? So, oh, darn. All right, so... Um, We've got a couple of value objects. Value objects are immutable objects, so we're going to use a record. We're going to put that in our domain package, not in all caps. And ticket will have our uh, we'll have we'll call it an ID, um, string name, beverage, beverage. All right, so we will have a, a rest, a post command. We'll get this place order command, and then we'll say logger info received order. And right now, we'll just return new ticket. Um, for the moment, we'll return a new ticket like this. All right, so let's fire. Let's get Quarkus running too. Um, terminal. Whoops. Uh, uh, compilation failure on Barista API. Go back to this. I'm just going to delete that for the moment. Um, we'll get Quarkus running here. And we'll send over some hot chocolates ID. All right, there we go. We're not sticking in anything in the database, so our ID is null right now. All right, so a couple of notions, a couple of things here. Um, the idea we've got in our domain, we have value objects, right? So these objects are immutable, right? Uh, the beverage, the placeholder, beverage is, beverage is an enum, but placeholder command and tickets are both Java records, right? Meaning that we can't do anything with them. So we're not going to store this in the database. They just provide um, information. It's just a way to, to move information back and forth my slides, a way to move information back and forth, right? So that's what a value object is. So an aggregate is something that we're going to stick inside of the database. And our aggregate, in this case, will create a Java class, and we'll call it uh, an order, right? We'll call it a truck order. And that will be, you know, entity extends panache entity. And that will be things like string name and uh, beverage, beverage. That's going to be enumerated. So it's like enumerated, enumerated. And I like en enum types. So enum type string, right? Your default constructor for hibernate. 
Oh, and then we had a double, right? We had a double total, right? So this is going to be in, a, in, the, in an aggregate. The idea, one of the ideas in DDD, and I mentioned this is an older idea, an older or an older concept that I think the the rise of ORMs, things like Hibernate, really kind of made it, and JPA made aggregates a little bit easier to use. But if you think the way that we used to write SQL queries a long time ago in an application, so let's say that we had like de on a dependent object graph. Maybe we also had you know a one to many toppings, right? Um, and we had you know some sort of toppings, right? Um, thing here and we were going to save many tables well when you were writing out your your sql queries you know hand tooling them it was really easy to write to immediately or read from those dependent tables and so in domain driven design the idea was we're only going to have a top level aggregate and everything you do is going to go through this particular class right this is the only class you're ever going to read or write everything else will cascade from there um, and they had a lot of methods you could add into the object to do that Today, ORM takes care of that for us. Um, but the idea is we still want to have, you know, um, one sort of top level entity. And that top level entity shouldn't get spread across the application. That's why we have value objects. And we, we want to talk back and forth using these value objects. So um, now one thing we talk about in uh, microservices is everybody gets, you know, their own uh, domain model, right? Everybody gets their own um, objects. But when you're starting with a monolith, it makes sense to share certain things. So things like beverage, place order, command, ticket, those we should really share those because those are going to be used by a lot of different parts of the application. So let's just go to a different, let's put this in a different package. We'll put it in a top level domain class, right? And so those will be, we can use those throughout the application. So like this, so the truck order, I'm going to, deal with only inside of the, the truck window. I'm going to save that to the database here. Nobody else is going to see that. I'll use a value object to pass over to the barista to actually make these kind of drinks here. All right, so that's a that gets us aggregates and value objects. So services and repositories. So while we're talking about database, we might as well just talk about a repository. So what we would do here um, is we would want to, instead of, actually, we'll start with services first. So the idea, and this gets back to the phrase hexagonal architecture, this is an input to our application. Well, I could have multiple other inputs. I could have a mobile app. I could have messaging, something else. So what I want to have is I want to encapsulate the functionality um, of persisting my uh, uh, of persisting and, and handling other stuff inside what's called a service. So let's go inside of here. We'll have a service, and we'll say a Java class. We'll say truck window service, add this kind of thing. This is application scoped, create a logger. And we'll have, say, let's have a uh, public uh, ticket place order, place order command, right? So that looks good, place order command. Um, so I'll get my place order command, and what I'm going to do here is I'll, I'll just zoom this up a bit since um, that should be easier to read, but also not uh, also visible. We're going to want to create a new beverage. What was our order? What's our uh, the order we're going to persist? So we want to call a truck order. Truck order. I say put. Um, and actually say place order command name, place order command beverage, and place order command total. Um, so let's see, I don't have this constructor yet, do I? So let's create a constructor with everything. All right. And um, I want to use a repository. So this is a service. So the next thing I want to do is I want to persist the object, right? I want to persist truck order. And then I'm going to want to tell the barista, you know, send it, uh, send to the barista, right? Um, so this is the next thing. And this services do, a, services simply orchestrate what happens. Um, and actually truck order, creating a new truck order, I really should encapsulate that business logic because I'm getting, um, I really should encapsulate this business logic inside a static method on truck order. Um, so that way I can encapsulate any any other sort of um, 
any other sort of stuff that has to happen with it um, inside there. Um, but we're kind of pressed for time, so I'm going to try to go really quick and knock this out in 10 minutes. So persist this. We want to use a repository to persist things. And luckily, um, Hibernate makes that, or Panache makes that super easy for us to do. So we can say truck window, no, truck order repository. Truck order repository. And we'll create this. So all repository does is essentially this puts encapsulates all of the logic around um, persistence, right? So that way, if we need to override any methods, we can. All we have to do for Panache is implement a yep Panache repository truck order, and we're done. And so we can say uh, truck order repository truck order repository persist. Now I want to send this to the barista, right? So let's see. I get my barista method, my barista API here. I'll have uh, Ticket, make, beverage, ticket, ticket. All right, and I'm going to need to implement this class, right? So say barista implements Um, now, I should also have a, a barista service that encapsulates this for me. Right now, we're just going to be really uh, return ticket. Um, and let's, you know, let's actually simulate um, the fact that it takes a little while to make this. So let's say, let's do try yeah, thread sleep. We'll do a random delay. I'll say calculate delay. No, we don't need it ticket for that. We'll just calculate delay. Uh, we'll return an int. And what we'll return, let's do um, uh, um, new random next int. Ten. Yeah, that looks good. So that's what we're going to do is we're just going to calculate a delay, pretend that we're making this, and then return that back, right? So if everything's working now, we should take a second here. All right, so that did take a little bit longer, right? And that one took really fast. Let's go really quick. So, terminal here. So, received order. Ah. Try barista. Make this guy application scoped. Turn the one that we get back from our barista, right? And B. Logger are making that. through there anyway um so that gives us also an idea of what services and what repositories are all right so we make our packages structure around bounded contexts 
Um, we use domain-driven design. So value objects, which are immutable objects, we can use Java records for that. Those get bounced around between other um, between packages, right? So we're never we're not uh, sending persistent objects around. Um, repositories encapsulate all of our database access. Hibernate Panache makes that super easy to do. Um, and then the infrastructure calls into a service which organizes everything. Now, autonomous data. So one of the things you hear a lot about in microservices is that microservices sh should have their own data. In a monolith, you typically don't do that, and that's one of the things that can end up leading to a lot of problems later when you go to split things out. So what one thing you can do is just give each section its own schema. So if you want to build up schemas, you can give your barista, you can give your, your truck window, you can give your credit card service. Each of those can have their own schema. The way that would look um, here, it would be to add in multiple different data sources and then simply inject the data sources into the application. So if we want to come in here, like with, with Quarkus, you can just you would just inject data sources this way. Uh, if you guys can see this. Um, you would just end up with multiple different data sources. Um, you can give them names, like here's Barista, right? We can give them a window. You can have as many as you want, right? And all I'm doing, I'm using one database, but I'm using a different schema for each of these. And the, and the way this is this works is, if you notice like that, the order is only the, the the, the persistent objects only exist within that package, right? It's non-persistent value objects that are passed across. And so that way, if we come to pull this out, um, we don't have a problem yanking this out of there. I'm not going to put that in place because that's going to ask me for for uh, um, how to do that. And then all, all you have to do is just inject that into your class, and it works great. So let's put logs. Generate, let's add some logging there so we can see some debugging. All right. Let's go back to back to the slides here. All right. So avoiding bottlenecks. Um, if we notice what we've got going on right now, um, and what part of this is scaling, right? I mentioned earlier, scaling is one of the early problems. So scaling before you have to scale um, is it helps, right? So there's a number of different ways you can do this, right? So being asynchronous is one of those. Um, Quarkus comes with the mutiny um, programming model, small rye mutiny, which makes it pretty simple to do this stuff asynchronously or have these execute on other thread loops. Um, what that would look like here is, for instance, we have this uh, barista API as ticket make beverage. What we could do is we could have a uni um, um, ticket, uh, whoops, ticket uh, make beverage. And what that's going to do is that, what, what do I have to really from? So what that's going to do is that, uh, yeah, let's give it a different name. So what that would do is this is going to execute on the Vertex event loop that's going on under underneath Quarkus. We could then come back and instead of returning this immediately, we could make a void method, right? So we could have a, uh, let's just do a, um, whoops, post and we'll say public. And we'll say a response, right? And we'll say place order async. And we'll still take a place order command, place order command, right? And we're going to do a JAXRS response. And what we're going to do is we'll return response. Accepted. Return new. Response accepted, build right. So when we say play, we need to give it a different path here, right? So this way, if we if we do this, all we do is we get we can call our service. We should have a this encapsulated in our service, so we can say inject truck window service. Do we have a truck window service? We have a truck window service, yeah. Truck window service in domain. Is this uh, it is application scoped? Ah, there we go. All right, we can just call our truck window service place order, place order command, right? So now we can use a void method here. And actually, we should probably use an async here. Let's create that method. And this can be the same thing, right? So 
this just tells Hibernate to do this asynchronously, right? So I'll do it in a uni. And what we would what we can say is uni, whoops, uni create from item, and we can say you know barista make beverage you know, new ticket right create our new ticket that way we can also persistence we have to wrap that stuff inside of um asynchronous code asynchronous code might look a little bit odd at first um and there is definitely a learning curve but it is kind of nice to get it in place and you will definitely see your application perform better um, another way we can do this is we could one of the things that uh, quarkus will allow us to do is to use a vertex event bus, right? And so we can use a vertex event bus event bus. Um, and then what I can do, instead of sending this directly to the barista, I can remove any knowledge of the barista from my application. I can take the barista out and I can say, let's still create my ticket object here. But then I can say event bus. send barista ticket and then in my barista i can listen so i can come here i can have a make beverage right but my make beverage whoops sorry i'll say avoid make beverage let's say avoid make beverage and i can say consume consume event barista and so what this is going to do is vertex under the covers has an in-memory event bus it's not like old-fashioned event buses um, what this means is it's going to pass that object in memory and so when i kick that object off from it's going to be consumed here and then it will continue making the beverage right so let's say that why does it like calculate all right to say 5,000 milliseconds, right? It's getting mad at that method. Um, what is it, Matt? Do I need another one of these? All right, there we go. So um, now I can listen on this event loop. So now I can completely decouple these, right? So when, it, when a message comes in, um, it'll simply grab when it comes into the resource, it'll grab it, pop it on an event loop. It'll get picked up here, made, and then we need to pop it back onto a different event loop, right? So then we would need to say, you know, event bus, event bus, publish, right? So we would publish event bus, you know, publish. Um, and we would, when it comes back up, right? When, when we're done, we would publish it back to the event loop and pick it back up front instead of instead of directly calling the APIs, right? So scale up before you have to scale up, one th what scale, scale up before you have to scale out. So one way we can do that is we can leverage um, Quarkus uh, natural event loop. So we can use the small rhyme uni package to do that. We can pass back unis or multis, or we can go completely asynchronous using uh, the event bus. Now, if we then eventually have to move to these citadels and outposts pattern number seven, um, what we're gonna do, whoops, yeah, number seven, so we move to Siddles and Outposts, our barista API impl, right? So right now we are consuming an event. And, okay. Yep. So right now we are consuming an event and we are simply calculating the logic here. Um, but what we could do is we could pop this on a Kafka queue, right? So we can have an emitter emitter whoops so we need to add that dependency i didn't build this with uh this in place EXT add small rye reactive messaging all right so i've added a new dependency in here reload the project so we know what so that uh, we know about this and what I would do here is once it comes in instead of doing my logic here I'd say emitter 
So now I can pop this out to a Kafka topic, right? And because I've coded to an API, I don't have to make any changes to the rest of the application, right? This is going to behave exactly the same way as it would. I can swap this implementation out really, really easily. All right, so to recap our topics here, whoops. So first thing, embrace code quality. There's lots of plugins you can throw inside of your POM. Um, there's things you can put inside of your build. Um, you, and where you determine where you draw the line between breaking the build or simply just like looking at things using as part of your code reviews is up to you. Certain things you want to break the build for, certain things you probably just want to look at during your code, code reviews. Um, continuous delivery or being able to commit at any time and not just being able to commit, but being able to roll back to a previous version at any point in time is really important. It doesn't have to be any harder than just throwing, you know, a little action file into, um, if you're on GitHub, just throwing a little action file. Um, but you can do this on other version control systems, but have pipelines. Uh, in fact, in integration tests, you know, the better your pipelines are, uh, the more complete your pipelines are, the better shape you're going to be in. Um, third is use domain driven design, use bounded context, uh, build with those kind of principles in mind right from the get go. It will make it easy to pull those things out. Um, so um, it, for, for a lot of these following reasons as well. APIs first, make sure you're coding the APIs and those can be internal APIs like Java APIs inside of inside of your, so each, each package, each of those bounded contexts, place an API that the rest of the application can talk to. That can then in turn become an, a different type of API. You know, I just, we just looked at wiring that up with Kafka. If you wanted to do it with REST, you can take that API can become your RESTful app, you know, API, it can become an async API, right? But use APIs to demarcate uh, your, uh, your packages. Make your data autonomous. So if you have to persist something, make all that persistence logic stay inside of each package. Using domain-driven design, using your bounded context makes that easy because anything the barista needs to record, I can just record inside that barista class package, right? So let's say I wanted to record the name of the barista that, that made the drink or how long it took to make it. I can record all that inside that package. And so that, that way, if I pull that out, it doesn't impact. There's no breaking changes you know, across the entire application. <clears throat> avoid bottlenecks. <clears throat> Reactive programming is nice if you can use it. Um, if, <clears throat> if you're using Quarkus, you know, leverage the event bus inside of Quarkus, right? Use message pass passing to completely decouple um, those packages from one another, right? In fact, we didn't even have to know about that API. If I just get an order in and all I have to do is like pop it onto the event bus when it's done, I've com I'm completely decoupled. I can do event-driven applications that way. Pop it on the event bus, it'll get picked up where it needs to. And it can get picked up by more than one place at time. And then when it, come, when it comes time to separate out a microservice, um, you just update uh, your, you just update, you know, one class and have that call out to a microservice somewhere else. You can use REST for that. You can use Kafka, whatever sort of transport that you want uh, to do. All right. Do we have any questions? Finish with five minutes left. Do we have any questions here? I can't see the chat, so... Um... Oh, there we go. Yeah, right. I, don't, I don't think uh, at the moment we don't have anything other than there was the question of if the if this recording will be available later, and yep. it will. It'll be a, a. I'm not sure how quickly it may be a few weeks uh, based on the last event, but it'll be posted eventually to the Red Hat Developer YouTube YouTube channel. So everything from from all the tracks for both days or for all of today, I should say, will be posted up to the uh, to the YouTube channel there. So you'll certainly have the opportunity to to go back and, and watch this in detail as well as um, as well as all the other sessions that, that were a part of that. So. All right. Well, great. Thanks for joining. Yep. Great. Appreciate it, Jeremy for a great presentation. If everyone uh, you know, certainly hang around, uh, we're going to stop the stream for a moment and, and set up for the next next one. We'll be having a presentation boost productivity of engineering team with developer portals. So we'll be right back and see you then. Thanks. Thanks.